Hey, everybody. How's next going so far? Good, yes, hopefully, awesome, love that. Uh, so a little background, my name is Allison Wagenfeld and I head up marketing for Google Cloud. I've been with Google since 2016. Actually together with Will, we were just reminiscing about the good old days and our very early Next conferences. And so we have come a long way and certainly one of the areas we probably come the farthest is our investment in working together with the startups that are such a core part of what we believe in and in our kind of roots at Google. And so thrilled that you are all here with us today as well. And um, a little more by way of background for myself, I came from venture capital right before I came over to Google. So I was a partner in Emergence Capital where I was an operating partner there working with all of our portfolio companies on their go-to-market strategies and also an investing partner as well. So it's particularly fun for me because I've always been an entrepreneur and an investor. In fact, even going further back, um, I started my career out in Silicon Valley at Intuit where I was the founder of Quicken Loans when I was there. So I wrote that original business plan and helped scale that before we spun it out and went over to a kind of Perkins back startup as the second employee myself after that uh, before doing a couple other things and now of course here at Google. So thank you for joining us here today. I am honored to be here with Will Granis, who's the Chief Technology Officer of Google Cloud, but of course he has lots of other backgrounds here as well. So actually we'll take a seat. All right. And uh, Welcome. Um, yeah, so yeah. great to be here together yes. with you. We were joking that <laughs> Will has had many hats here, and in addition to being, I guess in your pre-Google days, a startup founder, and we'll go back in that um, story as well, but also working now really at scale with Octo, and he even did a stint of helping out in our public sector business as well. So if any of you sell into the public sector at all, be sure to catch Will and ask him a couple of questions about that as well, because he has a lot of unique insights there. So thrilled to be here. Yes, you, absolutely. Right uh, so Allison, an icon in the startup world. I feel like I'm yeah, uh, in your shadow today, but that's okay because uh, you know a lot of a lot of uh, the inspiration for coming to Google was to unlock uh, what we saw, what I saw from outside as really interesting capabilities, and unlock that for everybody. And a fun fact, you know, our business is built. GCP was built on startups and digital natives scaling very quickly. And then the enterprises came, you know, in kind of the normal adoption curve. So one, I really appreciate all of you and your investment in time and you know, patience as we learn to get things right in the platform and our documentation and our quick starts. But you know, it's companies like yours that built GCP in the first place. And I, I really strongly believe it's gonna be companies like yours that keep the momentum going and help us achieve our goals. So thank you so much for being here. Um, as Allison mentioned, uh, so you know I'm probably not the the fanciest you know founder of all time. I have started uh, you know a couple companies. I've been an early stage employee in companies. I've done everything from modified digital signal processors to shoot out energy in a certain way. So you know we can we can close the link on L band satellite transceivers and do some things in the advanced telco world. Um, and I've also been on the other side, uh, having been an uh, investor advisor, I'm an advisor here at uh, Google Ventures, Google Capital, uh, been on the Defense Innovation Board with Eric Schmidt uh, here. So for those of you in the public sector and looking to you know, apply technology for public good, uh, you know, happy, to, happy to chat. Uh, but I think like the sum of all those experiences, have, uh, it's been an odd journey for me. So you know, kind of lots of small companies, lots of big companies, um, I've worked in four, three Fortune 100s as kind of an advanced R&D weirdo, someone who's trying to like plow the ground for the rest of the business that no one really understands. Um, so maybe you can identify with some of that because you're trying to lead a market sometimes uh, in ways that you know, bigger companies don't understand, and so you're taking advantage of that dislocation. Um, that's really my job here too at Google. So as the CTO, um, I think the reason I'm a CTO here is because I built stuff. And we were looking for someone who built a lot of things in the enterprise, who had been here for a sufficient amount of time to know something a little bit about a lot, because it's impossible for one person to know everything about everything. So I do you know, have my strengths and weaknesses as well. Um, but the CTO, I'm gonna, can I let them in on a little secret? It's, sure, okay. well, I, mean, I should say maybe it depends, but sure, go for it. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Here we go, That's Allison's like, uh oh, we didn't, we didn't here, rehearse so. this. Okay, so um, you know, the CTO origin story, I think it's important for you to know that the DNA of Google Cloud was always trying to be very mindful of building a bridge from our technology uh, to all of you. 
And so we didn't have a CTO function when I showed up. And for a year, you know, I was working on some of these kind of like first of use cases with some, uh, you know, digital natives uh, like, you know, Shopify and Spotify and others who are, you know, foundational customers now. And after about a year of doing that, you know, I got a phone call one day and, you know, Ours and, you know, Diane Green at the time. And Brian Stevens. And Brian <laughs> Stevens, who was the head of product. They said, you know what? we really should solidify our bridge between our technology and the people that need to understand how best to use it in really the most complex scenarios. And my guess is most of those are gonna be in areas where you're at because you're pressing the platform in a way that you know, isn't necessarily like a big kind of pattern, it's actually an emergent pattern. Um, and so in a lot of ways, our team was designed uh, to be very helpful to you know, companies like yours and I'm extremely uh, happy with how things have gone with some of those early customers, and I hope you know, that we can also uh, help in your journey. And so I'm looking forward to your engagement in this session and, and beyond. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we named the group, actually. Oh my gosh. Was like, so it was like, should it be the CTO office? And then it was like, okay, well, we the office of the CTO. So that's where the Octo <laughs> thing came in. And then there was like this whole group of people who were talking to CIOs and we're like, startups don't have CIOs. That's such like a big enterprise-y thing. So yeah. there was like this, all this conflict about the CIO and the CTO. So it's very much happy where we ended up with the Octo CTO. And to this day, I'm still scratching CIO out of lots of all of the um, <laughs> marketing materials. Oh, to Anytime it touches anything related to startups or scaling companies, I was like, that's just not a scale term. Yeah, well, I had one pro tip that I'm sure you know, the head of marketing would appreciate is that uh, you need a cool acronym. Right, if you want to succeed, and so we needed something. Office of the CTO, Octo. You know, we have a logo. We have like a little octopus. We do all the things that I'm sure all of you, being very scrappy, have had to do as well. To of course, they like, made the logo without running it by marketing. Of course, then, of course uh, I was like, like, oh, yeah. you're still willing to hang out with me, so I appreciate <laughs> that. Really Thank you. So maybe talk a little bit about it. You've you've hired tech teams over the years. Hopefully, everybody here is at the phase of hiring tech teams. Certainly, after you're getting all the credits that we're giving you all as you scale and build your. Um, particularly those of you working in new AI companies. Talk a little bit about hiring tech teams, scaling early tech teams. What are some of the lessons learned? Sure. Uh, again, this is just my experience. You know, uh, everybody's kind of a product of their own uh, you know, kind of experiences. So uh, probably principle number one, at least what has worked or things that I didn't do that I should have done that I'm now applying as a principle to do. Um, number one is, uh, I think I gravitated in the companies I was building. I was trying to bring people in that I got along with and that was like a, a top principle. And over the years, I actually have gotten the most value in relationships and building especially complex technology where the patterns aren't clear yet with, with people who um, I can get along with but also probably challenge me more. And so I would say like if you're building out a team, one thing to always keep in mind is like, you know, do you have enough challenge and friction to really progress or is it an echo chamber? And that's actually something that I even try to solve for I, you know, even now, my, my team isn't, you know, the biggest team at Google. We're a pretty small, scrappy team of engineers, but, um, you know, I'm always looking for who can I add to the team that will give us a perspective that actually almost contradicts something that we're holding right now as dogma or an accepted principle. So, you know, number one, like, create the friction. Yeah, sometimes it burns out and sometimes it's not great, but the benefit you have a startup is if you decide you can take quicker action. Um, so that's, that's probably number one. Um, number two, and I was not, again, this is something I wasn't great at that I kind of learned over the years. Uh, pick the area that you really personally, so if you're like a technical founder, CTO founder, CTO, CEO kind of combo especially, um, where's the area that you really want to spend time in and give the rest to other people? And I found that was always difficult for me because I kind of like having my fingers in everything. I like knowing what's going on. And this is where the CEO and tech lead roles blur into each other. Um, but I found that if I wasn't willing to let go and give some space to, you know, up, like for example, um, in one of the startups that I did, we were, uh, we were using unsupervised learning and kind of k-means and other things to cluster up signals coming from uh, cyber endpoints and try to predict, you know, bad things that didn't have a CV, a critical vulnerability pattern against. And I was like, oh, this is great. Uh, but there were some parts of that architecture that I needed to kind of let go, especially like the cloud bits of it. Ironically, I gave the cloud bits away in that uh, company I spent more time on, like more of the machine learning and the algorithm part and the design part. So, you know, as a technical founder, for those of you out there that are kind of blurring the lines between the you know, CEO and CTO, 
Um, the more you can articulate what parts are really important to you and that you want to keep your technical chops in, it'll allow you to bring people in, uh, you know, in those other complementary functions. It's also a signal. Um, later on, I think it plays a, as you scale. It's also a good habit to get into because it's kind of like you could, I, I'm going to overgeneralize. You know, you may say this is BS. That's okay with me. Um, you can be like a technical fellow, you can be uh, you know, a business lead, you can be a talent developer, um, but you have to pick two of those. And really coming to grips with what I love to do, and so for me, you know, I gave up managing much bigger organizations in P&L, like I've led you know, businesses that were billions of dollars as uh, CEO, GM, and I just found that I really, really liked smaller teams and I really, really liked the technical bits, and I really liked the talent bits. Um, so I kept those, and I gave up the other one. Yeah, no, that's great to understand that and actually have that self-reflection. My guess is your first startup, you probably had a little less reflection and a little yep. bit more as time went on. <laughs> um, but that's, that's what the learning's all well, about. Well, uh, maybe dovetail on that. Um, one thing that really helped me over the years was uh, having an advisor, a mentor that was outside of my circle. We shall call him Bob today, because yeah. uh, I don't—I didn't clear with him, I, you know, the, the, that I was going to talk about. In fact, I don't even think I told you I was going to talk about this. Um, but uh, this was a person who always asked me like the question, and then dug in a little bit, and then gave me some hard truths. And uh, over the span of a couple different companies, in fact, the second company um, that I started, the only reason I think we were successful is because he challenged me on a very specific topic at a very specific time, and he's the only one. When you're in charge, people won't tell you the truth. I'm sorry, it's just true, right? We're humans. Um, and if you can find people that do, you keep them, you hold them close, and you value them forever. Um, and it just so happened that I found this person while I was a, I was a CTO in a big Fortune 10 company, and uh, I bumped into him in a board of advisors meeting, and immediately we started uh, you know, going back and forth, and he became a lifelong asset, so kind of like a 1B on talent, there's the organic talent within your company, but you as a founder, CTO, or, or business lead, you need somebody uh, calling you out. And if you look at all the like companies that have succeeded, there was this great book about uh, Coach in the yeah. Valley, and uh, most successful. Uh, you mean the one about Bill Campbell? Yes. Yes. Okay. So most he was actually one of my first. Um, like mentor as an advisor yeah, at Intuit. He was the CEO of Intuit go. when I was there. Yeah, there you go. I mean, it, and it's a common story. You hear this all the time. And if you don't have somebody like that, um, making that a priority may sound like you don't need it, or maybe that's trivial advice, but um, like it, I, I'm a data person. So I'm like looking at the correlation and all the companies that actually make it through these things of scale and that the founders and the technical founders maintain control and maintain a, you know, a, like the rudder on the ship as it scales out. That's one common trait. No, it's, it's actually so interesting. So I remember actually talking to Bill Campbell once when there was something with Quicken Loans that wasn't going right. And he's like, you're hearing it all in stereo to me and the <laughs> co-founder I was with. How come you don't hear it? Right. And I was like, sometimes when you just hear things in stereo, you don't hear because you just want to hear your own truth. So I'm actually, we're going to go off script here a little bit. Please. How did you get better at hearing feedback that you didn't necessarily want to hear? Because I think there's always a little bit of cognitive dissonance. Oh, yeah. Where, um, failure. Honestly, okay. like so I wish there was talk about that a little bit. Like I wish there was a shortcut. So I mean, my first uh, my first company, we uh, so I was in early stage. I was like employee number nine in a company, and uh, we scaled really, really quickly. And uh, one of the things that I didn't do uh, was I was given I was given a lot of like early signals about hey, you know, uh, we really need to think about the manufacturing, like how we're going to scale out manufacturing of this. This was a this was the satellite L-band transceiver thing that I was talking about earlier, and you know, I kept I kept thinking about like you know we'll be able to solve that problem, we'll be able to solve that problem. The value is somewhere else. And I kept getting a lot of advice that actually no, you really need to think about this from people who knew, and uh, it turned out that we had a pretty catastrophic event where uh, our manufacturing quality went down. And oh by the way, like it turned out that you know lessons learned hard are the best. Uh, I. I at some point in the future, I was actually pressure test, so the pressure seals failed, and that's not really good when you're taking L-band uh, satellite transceivers and you're putting them on aircraft, or you're putting them on other things, like pressure is a big deal, oops. And uh, so to teach me a lesson, like I went and I had to go like manually test pressure seals for like a month or two and figure out how to do it well. 
And uh, you know, it's a small trivial example, but I, I think you probably, uh, my guess is on any given day, any given week, you bump into a scenario where um, you know, you've kind of taken a hit on something and maybe just encourage you to take a step back and kind of look for root cause and see if there's actually a time when someone was trying to coach you away from that decision. Uh, we usually don't take the second step. We usually just analyze the problem as engineers and then like find the solution, but actually finding the source maybe of the tremors that could have tipped you off. Um, that's actually a lot of what we do in the CTO office now because we get stuff wrong all the time. We, we take on you know, 10, 20 projects a year and we'll fail in six or seven of them. Um, but you know, it's as applicable in a small group of engineers inside a big company as it is to you know, startups trying to, I think, I think you know, trying to figure out how to like, increase the learning rate. Um, but you know, go to the source, like do a real root cause, but on the people side, not on the engineering side. And you may discover that there are some people in your org you need to listen to a little bit more, or there are some people outside of your org you need to hire. Yeah, no, those are really great reflections. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. I want... Painful. <laughs> exactly. Sorry to bring you I back. I know all down. about pressure seals, by the way. If anybody <laughs> wants to talk, I know all about this. All right, fair enough. So let's talk about scale a little bit. Hopefully this group is at a phase in your companies where you're now scaling. What are some lessons learned, things to think about? And when working with Google Cloud specifically, what are some the kind of advice you've been giving out to companies as they've been scaling? Uh, sure. Uh, so it sneaks up on you, has been my experience. Uh, I'd love to say perfect planning, you know, and I've always had great foresight and a crystal ball, but usually there's some event that happens or some trigger that happens as exogenous, it's hard to predict with, you know, because you, you're the expert in your area and you're the expert in, the, you know, the use case in the domain that you deal with. So there's usually like these things that happen and all of a sudden you've got to deal with uh, kind of the success disaster. Um, so I don't think, I, I try to be very pragmatic in how I spend my time, and one of the places I haven't spent my time enough in over the years is in building relationships and partnerships when I didn't need them. And uh, so when you're rapidly trying to scale, what you find is you're gonna need help with that usually. And so the more that you can get out and find kind of like communities for you know, things that you might anticipate you would need for scale. So if some of you are still doing like lots of stuff on-prem and you're just starting out into cloud, you know, there's communities that exist both like within the startup community, but also like there are some communities that exist for successful, you know, founders that have moved to cloud and there are some best practices there that you can take advantage of. You know, almost like networking ahead of the current demand um, is one thing that uh, may, might be useful for you. Uh, the leadership team composition is a really big deal. Uh, and yeah. I mean, this is an area you're a uh, you know, world expert in. My you know, two cents is, um, thinking about the construction of the leadership team for scale because you want to give people some time to get some reps in your business before you need them to go out and represent your business on a much bigger scale. Um, so uh, I think of like great pairs, you know, like pair programming works in my experience. Well, it also works as like find your pair. So if you're a, like a technical founder, find your, uh, find your Cheryl, you know, like find your Safra, you know, find your, you know, Eric, uh, you know, these are all business people that appended themselves earlier on, you know, to a, biz, uh, to a technical founder and the pair really created some magic. And so really thinking about that orchestration before you need it because, you know, the Cheryl and the Safra and the Eric's, they also need to understand the business before they can help you scale. And that learning curve takes some time. And we often underestimate like, one of the big failure modes is going to hire externally for scale. They don't understand your business. They haven't had the time to understand the technical foundations. And so then when they go to represent like the value you create or the business model, they're not actually creating leverage for you. They're creating more work for you because you have to go and loop behind them and then go explain all the things, yeah. right? Uh, so that awesome. couple, of, couple of thoughts. Yeah, no, it's great. It sounds like a lot of it is, you know, what I keep hearing you refer to as the team and the people yeah, that you surround yourselves sure. with because you just, you don't know exactly which direction anything is going to go. So if you have the right balance there. So I want to switch gears again now and talk about AI because that is um, front and center in case you haven't caught up on that here at Next and <laughs> everywhere um, in the world every day. So what are you seeing right now with the companies that you're working with at Octo and with all of the communities of startups and AI? What are some like two or three insights that you think that are particularly relevant for this group? Sure. Uh, one is, uh, depending on where you sit in like the AI value creation chain, you know, like some people are building models, 
Some people are wrapping services around models, so it doesn't just have to be a product-oriented company. It could be a service-oriented company that's really, you know, and there are examples of companies killing it right now, you know, on what I call like the ends of the spectrum. So from like, you know, building the models themselves all the way out to like professional services wrapped around, you know, a specific use case, specific industry, a specific segment. Um, there are a lot of different paths to success. And uh, I would say probably two to three years ago, GCP was really, really capable for kind of the, um, like you need an ops platform that'll smooth out some of like, uh, you know, it, it, ne it wouldn't necessarily create some of the intellectual property advantage on the model side, but it was a really good place to start and experiment and uh, start to learn how to like actually deploy ML on a consistent basis with ML ops, but it was very generic. Whereas today, like two, you know, over the last two or three years, if you wanna build, if, if your business model is you wanna differentiate on the model, I mean, you can use raw compute through GKE and you, know, you can tune for you know, TPUs, GPUs, and you can get some pretty amazing scale very quickly. I mean, companies like Anthropic, um, AI21, others who have really, you know, are pushing us, uh, but they're succeeding and they're, you know, like they're able to train very, very quickly. And they're also helping instruct us on what we ought to do around like ML fungibility. So being able to just deploy a workload and whether, and you know, let us take care of the heavy lifting of mapping that to what type of process or what type of execution environment. Um, so that's certainly that's certainly one uh, message is that wherever you sit on the, like kind of where you're creating value, there's an entry point. Um, I think the probably the second thing that is interesting to all of you, is, or maybe interesting to all of you, is there's also a lot of people now that that have created enough patterns for you to kind of find similarity with. So we have the AI, you know people that have built models, we have the folks who are creating their own platforms and using components of GCP to create like ML platforms within their own companies. Um, we even have digital natives that have succeeded on GCP, so they have a real firm sense of like, you know, how you do generative AI well while keeping it secure and keeping it private using VPCs and service controls and all the like, you know, cloudy patterns that all of you probably think are just, you know, obvious. Right, but have been a really big challenge for big companies. There are enough digital natives now that have plowed that ground that these patterns exist. I was talking to some of you before this, I think one of the big challenges for us is to make them more obvious and easier to get to and faster to move from like, I have a question of how to do this to how to deploy or how to consume or um, you know, how to orchestrate. And so that's, you know, that's learning for us, but I think in those two areas, you know, there's plenty for, for you here. Yeah, no, I can imagine, I mean, the I agree that we probably could do a better job of distilling the types of questions, or at least the common questions yeah. that are coming in. And that's actually one of the reasons that we have functions like this, because we're listening as much as we are sharing. And actually, I should mention, you probably know this, but we do have these generative AI live in labs events around the country. So if you look at our website, you can see when some of those are happening. And if it's appropriate, you can go there and meet with some of our customer engineers or some members of our team to go deeper into some real kind of specific technical use cases there. And that's also part of why we have the AI startups program so that there's, again, these peer groups, yeah. you said, that are really critical. Yeah, like if you're generating uh, you know, marketing content, for example, like you should talk to Canva. And if you're doing it across multiple languages or geographies, like they're an awesome company who's figured out how to use GCP to take like content and you know, translate it super fast and super efficiently. And that's what I mean by like there are companies in almost like every segment or every problem space is a question of just like, I think, surfacing it and also being willing to share what you're really after. One of the things that we see a lot in our early work with um, especially small companies is this perception that like, you know, we're gonna share with you something very, very sensitive or about our business, about how we wanna create value and then like Google's gonna take that and you know, do something with it. The truth is like we succeed as a multi-tenant platform at scale and you know, consumption of compute is like the deal for us. And so we're not gonna extend into a whole bunch of like bespoke software and bespoke like journeys because that is fragile and it's not a good business for us. So it's okay, don't be afraid, please like share what you're actually trying to accomplish so that we don't like lay stupid templates on top of what you're trying to do and you're like, oh, that was such a waste of time. And I feel like we just spent six meetings with Google and we didn't get like anything useful. Like tell us how you're trying to create value. And uh, 
the companies that are you know, on the reference list, they've all you know, kind of come to that place where they're now sharing very openly like their problems with XLA and some of the things that sit underneath the hood of like optimizing performance on us. And as a result, like stuff's getting put into the roadmap and getting done. Yeah, so that gets right into what my last question was going to be. And then I think we have time for a few questions yeah. from this group. So if you want to be like thinking about anything that you'd like to ask, well, I'm also happy to answer anything as well. So in terms of staying ahead of the curve, so one of the ways that you said is share openly as much as you feel comfortable, obviously, so that we can help you. Anything else, any other advice for this group? Oh, let's see. Um, well, I mean, I should be getting advice from all of you because you're building the future. Um, maybe a couple of things. Uh, one, speed is your ally. Uh, one of the things I bump into a lot that takes speed away is trying to do too many things. Um, it may seem counterintuitive, but like doing, and, and this is like the, always the, you know, it's like, this is in every book, right? Or every pitch or every like, you know, coaching you've probably gotten from any investor is like, do this thing, do it really well, do it really fast. And I'm just gonna say it too. <laughs> do one thing, do it really well, and do it really fast because we've seen some companies, because generative AI is, is kind of spinning so quickly, what's happening is there's like this shock wave and companies think that they have to like pivot to the newest like approach or thing and what it does is it slows you down. Um, so I would argue that sometimes it's counterintuitive, but you may have to put the blinders on a little bit to all of like the fast spinning you know, goo coming at you and kind of stick to your guns and try to create kind of linked value so that you know, what you're building and how you're taking it to market and the operations that support it and the people that you hire, all those things match. Because uh, a classic example of this is when a company tells me they're a product-based company and then uh, they're doing a bunch of professional services engagements because they believe that that's the only way to keep their company alive. And so they hire a bunch of professional services and they don't ever get to the product bit. And they get valued in, on professional services and that's not what they wanted. Listen, I, I, services companies are awesome businesses to be. They are awesome but you've gotta have the right like, business processes, talent, like value proposition to match it and pull technology you need to actually make that happen and not too much. If you're a product company, like which part are you trying to optimize? And I think that that's one of the, the goods, like we put out so much at one time, but it's also one of the risks is that there's so much that it's easy to get distracted and try to do too many things. 